and bring up Gregory Laughlin. Yeah, I'll just do a quick introduction here. Okay. So, uh, you know, we've had really a, a long line of great speakers that have visited WAS over 45 years. You know, we've been a society that long now. In fact, in May, it was a 45 year anniversary. I wanted to have this big party and then the cootie struck and nobody's having a big party, so. And the new scope. But, yeah, yeah, we did get a new scope, so that helped. But uh, yeah, so 45 years now as a society, you know, we've had uh, Michio Kaku uh, has visited, Heidi Hamill, uh, Columbia's Caleb Scharf a couple of times, uh, the Hayden Planetarium's Carter Emmert, uh, many of the curators of the American Museum of Natural History, Great speakers from JPL, a wide representation of all of our regional colleges and universities. And next month, he's in chat tonight too. Um, on July 18th, we welcome back one of our own. Joshua Nelson will be uh, will be joining us, and he is uh, the former president of WAS, the Next Generation, and he recently worked three years on Osiris Rex. So he's going to talk a little bit about that. And of course, Osiris Rex right now is orbiting and about to get a sample of the asteroid Bennu on October 20th and then return it to Earth. So Josh has a brand new gig. He's in Houston now. He's an ISS flight controller at Johnson Space Center. So it'll be great to have uh, Joshua back, talking a little bit about what he's doing, what he's done. And uh, so that's next month on July 18th. So we'll be booking uh, a bunch of, uh, of speakers for uh, virtually, I guess, for as, as long as we have to until we can start having them back in the, uh, in the classroom again. But it's been really two and a half years since astronomers in Hawaii discovered a strange cigar-shaped cigar object speeding through the solar system on a trajectory from far away and towards even farther away. Now it was a lot of it was kind of a lot of fun to think for a brief time it could have been an alien artifact or something creepy like that making its way slowly through the solar system. But you know what is the thing? Is it a comet? Is it an asteroid? Or is it something completely different that we don't expect or understand yet, or, or just beginning to understand? And today, Uamua, the Hawaiian term for scout, it's long gone. It's somewhere out between Saturn and Neptune, and it's gone. But is it any relation to 21 Borisov, which was an interstellar comet that visited our solar system late last year? And are there more in the way? And can we detect them in these other dark, distant objects like Planet Nine? Is that something? Well, we'll find out tonight. So uh, we'd like to welcome Greg Laughlin. He's a professor of astronomy at Yale University. It's his first time with us and his research focuses on the formation, characterization, and evolution of planets both in our own solar system and beyond. Yeah. So the WASP virtual free lecture series is pleased to welcome Professor Gregory Laughlin. Professor. Well, thank you. Um, I hope you guys can all hear me. Um, and so I'm just going to uh, share my screen here. Let's see. Um, one moment. Just trying to find the right. <clears throat> We've practiced this a whole bunch of times, and then um, now I can't see. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> so there, I think you guys can all, all see my screen. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cheat a little bit. So for parts of the talk, I'm going to just go in the uh, slideshow presenter uh, mode, like you see right here, rather than the full-on slide mode. And it just allows me to kind of get a sense of where I'm at and easily go around in the talk. Um, and, and boy, you know, before I start talking, I, I really want to uh, express my admiration of some of those photographs that we saw. Um, to think that those were taken in Connecticut it's unbelievable. Um, just, just good work, you guys, on that. Um, and that just kind of like to start with a poem that I know that a lot of you have seen uh, from from Walt Whitman. And uh, this is a poem that that most astronomers who give public talks or talks to larger groups are are uh, well advised to keep in mind. Um, <laughs> this uh, when I heard the learned astronomer with proofs, the figures ranged in columns before me when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add. Um, and, and then this guy is just saying that, that he wandered off by himself rather than to listen all, to all that. And so in this modern age of Zoom meetings, it's even easier to wander off all by yourself, either by turning on mute or just letting me uh, squawk, squawk, squawk out of the screen. So I really will try to keep it interesting. I'll try to keep it um, under, under time and try to keep it in, in engaging. 
And so after, after that kind of warm up, it's gonna be kind of a disappointment to see this slide, right? This is probably not the kind of slide you wanna see from the speaker of the month for the first slide. Um, unless of course you're a big fan of minor planets and comet hunting. So this is a, this is an electronic circular from the Minor Planet Center, uh, which was circulated on October 25th, 2017. And pan stars and the other, other uh, automated comet hunters and amateur comet hunters are finding comets all the time. And so there's lots of minor planet circulars, lots of new asteroids found. Um, so it's by no means particularly exciting if a minor planet circular comes out, it's a minor event. But this one, uh, for those in the know, uh, was quite interesting because uh, what you can see here, and I've highlighted it, it's pointing out the discovery of an object with an eccentricity of 1.2. And what that means is if that eccentricity is correct, this is something that came from outside the solar system that has just been picked up. This is an interstellar visitor, a notice of an interstellar visitor that is currently in the vicinity. Um, this discovery was initially made at PANSTARS, which is an Air Force uh, funded telescope on top of Haleakala. Um, and then for this first minor planet circular, it was um, confirmed or at least observed uh, by several other observatories, three of which I've shown pictures here. One is on Tenerife, one is in um, sort of Italy, and the other is on top of Mount Lemmon in, in Arizona. And so what these minor planet circulars do is they just provide the observatory code, they provide the right ascension and declination, and they provide a, a magnitude of the object. And from all this information, um, you can compute the orbit, you can compute the trajectory of the comet or the asteroid, or in this case, the, the visitor through the solar system. So this comes from a Sky and Telescope article that I wrote um, a couple of years ago about Oumuamua. They, um, helped with this really nice graphic. And what this shows is just Oumuamua's, or I don't wanna call it Oumuamua yet because it doesn't have a name at this point in the chronology. This shows this alien object's trajectory through the sky. And uh, even in theory, if you get three measurements of position, if they're accurate enough, then that's enough to determine the entire trajectory. Gauss showed that in 1801, but as you saw on the, circular, there were a number of different measurements. So even at the moment of discovery, the trajectory was very well um, understood or was immediately apparent. The object uh, year after year after year came toward us uh, from the constellation Lyra. And then uh, during 2016 and 2017, if it were bright enough to be detected, which it wasn't, would have swept all the way through the night sky, northern night sky, um, like this, and it was right here uh, when it was discovered. So it's, it's trajectory, um, oh, and then of course now it's, it's long gone, it's left the solar system. And so it's trajectory um, viewed sort of with the JPL tools. Now what I can do is I can uh, start my play the slideshow so I can show the animation of the trajectory. Uh, let's see. Something went off there. Sorry about that. Not sure why that happened. Um, well, so, so what I was trying to show, which didn't seem to work, is just how the body came in from above the solar system through this line, um, entered the inner solar system, deep dipped beneath the ecliptic, um, came to within uh, 0.25 AU of the sun. It came uh, four times closer to the sun than the earth is. It was getting 16 times as much energy as the earth gets from the sun per square meter. Um, it was going 88 kilometers per second when it went past the sun, so really, really screaming. And then when it was detected, it was actually had passed the earth's orbit and uh, was on its way out. It was about right here where my arrow is uh, when it was detected by pan stars. And so it was caught sort of at the last moment that it could possibly be caught. And um, at its close approach, before it was detected, it went at about 30 lunar distances uh, from Earth. So that's kind of quite a close call from something that has been traveling through interstellar space to come within 30 lunar distances. It's a very exciting moment. Now I know that slides like this aren't great late 
in the evening um, for, for a talk. But what I want to just show here is that even when it was at its brightest, it was dim. Um, it's absolute magnitude, which is different from an absolute magnitude for stars, but it's absolute magnitude for um, in, the, in the comet and asteroid scheme was 22.4. So you guys know um, how dim that is. And it was a little bit brighter than that when it was first detected. It was a visual magnitude of something like 19, but it was fading very, very fast. And the main reason why it's fading very fast is because when something is lit by the sun and not lit by its own heat and light, then as it pulls away from the earth and is at a significant distance from the earth, then its brightness falls off at the fourth power of the distance. So as soon as it was detected, it was almost too late to observe it. And so there was a mad scramble once it was confirmed that something from outside the solar system had been detected. There was a mad scramble to basically enlist every major telescope in the world. Schedules were all overrided, overridden. If you were um, you know, a galaxy observer that night, you were out of luck because the telescope was pointing at this thing because it was the first time anything like this had ever been, ever been seen. Um, and so the, the very first night that it was detected, when that first minor planet circular came out, um, there was an astronomer, Joe Mazzaro, who was on the, the famous 200 inch at Mount Palomar um, in California. And he had been alerted to that circular. Um, and he was well set up to observe it. He had a spectrograph on the telescope. Um, he was supposed to be observing comets. Um, but he quickly uh, changed his program and got the first spectrum of Oumuamua. And when he reduced the data the next day, um, it was almost as boring as it could be. <clears throat> um, turned out that its spectrum shows no deep absorption lines or uh, any emission lines. There's, there's no real features in it other than noise but it does seem to have a reddish cast. So the thing is reflecting more red light from the sun than um, blue light. So if you could see it close up, it would have a slightly reddish tone. That's the one thing that the spectrum indicates. But that, that spectrum enough is enough to give us some hints about what's going on. It turns out that um, if we plot a muamua um, along with other stuff, in the outer solar system, things like inactive comets or Kuiper Belt objects or centaurs, which are asteroid, comet-like asteroids uh, that orbit between in the outer solar system, damoclids, which are burned out comets, um, active comet nuclei. Um, Oumuamua kind of falls within this general trend of reddish objects um, outside the solar system. And the kind of the default idea, if you don't know anything else, is that it was an object that would look something like, like Phoebe, um, Saturn's moon Phoebe, which if you were up there and you had um, careful color vision would, would have a slightly reddish cast. And the other thing that's not measured directly, but um, which is, is assumed to be the case, or is a good bet that is the case, is that it's not very reflective, that it have an albedo similar, for instance, to that to the moon. Um, of 10% of or, or, or less. It would be pretty pr pretty dark object if it's like all these other things in the outer solar system. And then interestingly as well, later on, um, the Spitzer telescope, which is an infrared telescope in space, which was still functioning, um, at least in several of its bands when Oumuamua went through, Spitzer tried to observe it and couldn't find it. Um, and so that what that was saying is that um, the Spitzer telescope, it, it was not producing its own heat. And that was consistent with it being a, a relatively small object. Um, and so just to sort of set the scale, be, because, you could, because you could find um, the, the brightness of it, and we knew exactly how far away it was from the orbit, and if we assume that it was relatively dark, or even if it wasn't dark, um, we can get a very good estimate of its size. And so it was something like about the size of a football field. And it's kind of nice to put that at scale against the MU69, um, which New Horizons visited roughly at around the same time, a year or so later. Um, and Oumuamua is just dwarfed um, by even a small outer solar system object like MU69. So this whole talk 
probably there's never been um, an astronomy talk at, 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 at the Astronomical Society about an object that's this small, right? Just, it's just not very big. We, we saw galaxies that were 100,000 light years across, and this thing is, it's a stretch if it's the size of a football field. So um, it's a lot, a lot of big deal about pretty small objects. It's important to keep that in mind. Um, I'm from the Bay Area, and so kind of putting it at scale, this is sort of how it, it compares, or how MU69 compares to San Francisco, and Oumuamua really isn't visible at this scale, especially because you're looking on Zoom at my screen, and so it's just disappeared into oblivion here. The point is, is that it's a small object. Um, so here's another minor planet circular from the next night. Um, about Mumuamua. This is um, also in 2017, on October 25th, but, but 20 hours later. <clears throat> and there's more orbital measurements of it, which pins down the trajectory even better. No surprises there. But the surprise, the interesting thing, is that even in extremely deep images at the VLT. So the VLT is no joke of a telescope. That's a 10 meter, eight meter telescope um, in, Cerro, in, in Chile. Um, even, even with a very deep uh, measurement with, with a huge telescope, there's no coma visible. This is, this is the object. Because the object's moving relative to the background stars, the stars are all tracking. You guys know how that works. Um, and so here's the stacked image of the object, and there's no coma. So it is absolutely, it's behaving like an asteroid. It's a point-like object. International Space Station would, would do the same thing. It would have no coma. Um, and then what's also interesting is, is that all of this data um, includes a magnitude measurement. So you see these magnitude measurements, 18.449. Um, oh no, sorry, that was the part of the right ascension. Where's the, here we go, sorry. Um, this is the magnitude measurement, 19.8. And you can see that over the course of two nights, it's fading pretty rapidly. But interestingly, it's also kind of bouncing around. Um, and so the light curve of an asteroid, um, if the asteroid is rotating, gives you a sense of both the features on the asteroid, the brightness features on the asteroid, as well as the asteroid's overall shape. And so I'll just show you uh, the data that came back. Now I know that this, this isn't a picture talk. I, I, I can't give a picture talk because you guys have better pictures, so I'm just giving you a data talk. Um, and what this is, is the data that was taken at a very serious array of big time telescopes. We've got the very large telescope in Chile. We've got the Keck telescope. We've got Gemini North, Gemini South. This is like, you know, the all-star, the all-star band um, of telescopes. And what you can do is you can take the brightness measurements of the object and then account for the fact that its distance is changing and put them all on the same scale and then look at how the brightness was varying um, from October 25th, the night it was discovered, through October 28th from all these different telescopes. And the one thing that's been done here is this is adjusted so the natural fade from the fact that it is getting further from the sun has been taken out here. So we're seeing the intrinsic change in its brightness with time. And Check this out. You guys are astronomers, so you'll be impressed. This is magnitudes here. So over the course of 3.6 hours, this thing is varying by three magnitudes, right? So that's um, getting, towards, getting towards a factor of 15 in variation in brightness over 3.6 hours. So what does that what does that tell you what it tells you is either it is showing extreme variations in reflectivity that is there's really bright spots on it and really dark spots what you're seeing is it rotates every 3.6 hours or every two times 3.6 hours or it's weirdly shaped so that you're seeing it edge on or face on repeatedly um and so this light curve, you can actually model, and this has been done. It was done by a Russian guy in 2019, or a guy with a Russian name in 2019. Paper is full of equations 
And um, the paper really, not a lot of people got through the paper, it didn't get a lot of traction, but I was very impressed by this paper. And what, the, what this, this 2019 analysis of these data indicated is that the data could be fit either by some sort of elongated cigar shape like thing or by a flat pancake like thing. And the flat pancake like thing is simply a more probable fit to the data, uh, given um, a sort of like it's more likely that this data was produced by something that was a flat pancake like thing. Now, if you want to make a big, exciting discovery, a flat pancake-like thing that looks like some pancake batter on a skillet just isn't as exciting as this, right? So this picture, which is what they decided to go with, they hired uh, the ESO artist to do this, this became the public face of Oumuamua. So their interpretation of this light curve was that this light curve is produced by a cigar shape that is tumbling chaotically through space. And it was with it's slightly red. And it was basically space art rendered in this way. And so this, this picture, especially if you look at it on a cell phone screen, is just incredible, right? It looks like this menacing starship-like shard. And then also from a just fantastic public relations standpoint, they came up with a name for it. Um, they came up with a native Hawaiian name. Um, and in the official announcement, um, it, it says that the name comes from Hawaiian, Hawaii, Hawaiian. It means muamua, meaning a scout reaching out for. It. And it reflects the way this object is like a scout or a messenger sent from the distant past to reach out from us. So the language that's used in the official discovery announcement is imparting agency to this object and implying implicitly, but not explicitly, that it, it, it's, it's, it's some kind of um, starship or something like that. Um, and then interestingly, if you go to the Hawaiian dictionaries that are online, the definition for the Hawaiian word muamua is a little bit more, um, there's a little more color to it than what was given by the um, official announcement. Here's the actual definition of Oumuamua. Oumuamua is the foremost soldier or the front rank in battle. A scout, one sent forward before a battle to discover the position of the enemy. So um, ah, that's, 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 that's quite interesting. Um, and so, Later on, a, a little while later, in the next, next year, and the data was analyzed very, very carefully for Oumuamua. And what was found is that it didn't follow a perfectly hyperbolic trajectory. It accelerated slightly as it left the solar system. Um, it basically left the solar system one one thousandth with one one thousandth the acceleration of gravity less than it should have. Um, and so it 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 was boosted a little bit as it left the solar system. Um, and so what 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 I've shown so far it's it's 850 p.m. What I've shown so far is basically everything that's known about Oumuamua. I'm not holding back any information that anybody has and it's something that's completely new um, completely alien and to understand it we have to deal with these kind of skimpy facts that that I've, I've i've just presented there's no there's nothing more and because it's gone for good there's no chance to ever get more um, information about it and so so it invites speculation and it invites theorizing and it continues to be a really interesting really interesting puzzle um so the, the acceleration the fact that this thing kind of picked up a little bit as it left the solar system um is similar to what comets do so here's a here's a picture um of 67p you guys have likely seen this and 
the, this is you know, sort of an object a few miles across that was visited by the Rosetta mission. And you can see that the sunlit face is, is developing a jet. And this, this jet is um, going to be strong enough to make a small impact on the orbit of, of this comet. So this comet will accelerate as well in a similar way that Oumuamua did. And the only thing that's strange about Oumuamua's acceleration is that there was no visible jet of any kind. There was no coma. Um, and it was checked carefully for signs of outgassing. And um, no carbon-containing molecules were found. Um, the check for water wasn't, wasn't particularly um, high resolution or high precision. So the limits on the amount of water that could be coming off of it were, were not very good. And so the assumption was is that it must be some kind of comet that's unusually pure water that doesn't have the kind of cigarette smoke micron-sized dust that most comets have. And so it didn't create a coma, but it did have a jet because it did accelerate. And you can kind of understand how that works. Um, this, this animation right here, what I'm showing is sort of a elongated Oumuamua-like object, which is, has a jet which pushes it um, oh, basically right at the point where the sun is shining down most directly. So Oumuamua didn't have these axes associated with it, but we can kind of understand its, its, its motion, its, its sort of tumbling-like motion, if it had a jet that was always uh, sort of tracking the sun. That's something that, that, that seems to work quite well. And um, this is like the simplest geometry, but you can also have like a three-dimensional um, geometry. And so this is just a model that we made in which we have a sort of surfboard shaped elongated object. And this works for a pancake object or a cigar shaped object as well, in which the sun is illuminating it. And then as the sun illuminates it, a jet is produced. And the jet is sort of wandering over the surface of the body. And so what that does is that causes the body to tumble. And it makes a light curve that can look very similar to the light curve that was actually observed. And so the idea that a muamua was basically a comet-like object that just was didn't have micron-sized dust um, entrained with it, which was sort of evaporating or sublimating as the sun shone upon it, that, that seems to work pretty well. Because water ice wasn't very strongly ruled out by the observations, the assumption is just that it didn't have much carbon um, containing molecules in it, but there was lots of water ice. It's basically an ice cube. Um, and with, with that model, things seem to work pretty well. And, you know, you can do even more um, complicated models where there's modeling on the surface and where it's slightly red. And you can get basically data that looks quite a bit like the actual data that, that, that came from a Muamua. And so, so a year or two ago, we thought we'd really pin down what was going on with it? We thought it, you know, it's a comet, but it's a weird comet. That was the sort of the, the, the conclusion that we came to. And, you know, the exciting thing about Oumuamua was that it was detected so readily. It came so close to the Earth. It was detected by PANSTARS, which is not a large telescope. And um, the Vera Rubin telescope, which is formerly called LSST, which is coming online uh, very soon, should be incredibly good at detecting objects that are coming into our solar system like a muamua if objects like a muamua uh, are common and indeed it, it now seems that that if you have stars forming with planets if there's planets forming in the disks that surround young stars then the, the planets will continuously eject comets into the interstellar medium. Our own solar system probably ejected many Earth masses worth of comets into interstellar space. And every star that's, that's forming, um, if it has a giant planet at least as big as Neptune, um, really should be doing the same thing. And so um, the fact that Oumuamua went through is suggesting that, that giant planets and planetary, protoplanetary disks are very, very common in the galaxy. 
And, and we're getting really good evidence that that is indeed the case. Um, there's a, a radio or millimeter wave telescope, ALMA, which is down in Chile, which has been operating for several years. And ALMA is, has a high enough resolution that it can zoom in and look at young protostellar disks, young systems where planets and, uh, and, and uh, uh, disks are forming. And what you see when we look at these in detail, you see these gaps in the protostellar disks. And these gaps are very naturally carved by planets that are inside the gaps, planets of sort of Neptune size. And so it looks like planets that are similar to Neptune in orbits that are similar to Neptune's orbit are very common in, in, in our galaxy. And if they are very common in our galaxy, then they should be spewing tons and tons of comets into interstellar space. And the, the, the comets should be um, coming in to our solar system on a regular basis. Um, this is just some calculations that, that we're doing on the blackboard, trying to understand how many comets should be coming in. And the, the conclusion is, is that LSST, the Vera Rubin telescope that's going up now, really should be able to detect several of these interstellar objects per year. So it's, it's kind of an exciting forthcoming um, opportunity. Um, but then the amateurs um, got, got a jump on the LSST. And uh, just last year, a second interstellar uh, object was discovered. Um, Borisov was the Russian amateur astronomer who, who discovered it. And Borisov uh, kind of came through the solar system with an orbit that looks like this. As you can see, Borisov's orbit is even more extreme than Oumuamua's, and it was traveling very, very rapidly. And it's just kind of zipping through the solar system. It's not making a wild uh, turn in its trajectory from coming close to the sun. Um, and interestingly, Borisov behaves exactly like what you expect a comet to behave. It looks exactly like a comet from our own solar system. There's nothing unusual at all about it. Um, these are just um, pictures of it that were taken with the Keck telescope. Um, and yeah, just putting the Earth by in comparison to, you know, show that it has this gigantic coma associated with it. So the comet itself, of course, is just probably a couple miles across. Um, way, way down in the center. And all the light that you're seeing is from micron-sized dust that's been ejected from the comet and is very, very efficiently scattering um, sunlight. So comets, if they behave like regular comets, are extremely good at making themselves well apparent, even though they have tiny sizes. But Oumuamua, remember, did not do that. Oumuamua was the size of a football field, and it looked like it was the size of a football field, no coma. Um, and so Borisov is really sort of telling us that we're on the right track with planet formation, understanding how that, that occurs. There should be objects like Borisov, and we see objects like Borisov. But recently, it's been pointed out that there's a real, real, real problem with Oumuamua, and that is that even if it was made of pure ice um, and received all of its energy from the sun, the energy that it received from the sun was just nowhere close to being enough to create the acceleration that was observed. And the reason is because to, to, to accelerate something with water, you have to sublimate the water, which takes an extraordinary amount of energy. And you have only a small amount of energy left over to, to push the acceleration. Water makes, sublim subliming water makes a horrible, horrible rocket. Um, Elon Musk would not be involved with water as a rocket fuel. Um, it turns out that's impossible, actually, that Oumuamua was accelerated by water. And it turns out that hydrogen, solid hydrogen, is the only substance that's really capable of explaining Oumuamua's properties. And solid hydrogen doesn't form in protostellar disks. It's, it's too warm. Um, solid hydrogen, we think, can uh, sort of build up objects only in the darkest, coldest clouds, uh, cores of molecular clouds. And so it turns out that Borisov is probably um, a completely ordinary comet, whereas a Muamua 
was really, really was something weird and completely exotic. It seems like it was a solid hydrogen object. And what's exciting is that if more of these things are coming in, we're going to get the opportunity in the next few years to do missions to them. Um, you guys will remember the Deep Impact mission in which um, a solar system comet was smashed by a, a probe, which kind of excavated material and the spectrum was taken of it. Um, and if we'd found Oumuamua in time, we easily could have um, sent a, a low cost, low delta V mission to effectively get in its way and um, do the same effectively probing that Deep Impact did. We have a mass object that slams into Oumuamua. Um, it would have put a bunch of stuff up and would have been able to understand a lot about how it, how it formed. Um, so I see that I'm already at, at nine o'clock. So I'll just sort of wrap it up here with this sort of like bird's eye view of this new branch of astronomy that, that is coming, coming up very quickly. And it's something too that, that you know, amateurs are going to be able to participate in because these objects um, are discoverable as is evidenced by Borisov um, by small telescope observers. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, stop there and, and, and thanks for your listening. Oh, we have questions though, Greg. There's, there's, oh, sure. Peanut gallery is going off here. So, okay. And Alex, you want to you take that away? Yeah. So, uh, one question from uh, Michael Southam uh, is the, you had two different models of the shape. One, one of them was the cigar shape, but you, but it sounded like the data was really implying it was more of a flat pancake. And yeah, the, you had a model, you know, the model that was interactive there. Is that sort of the, the pick, the depicting more of their shape that you think it, it, it is? No, that, that, so, so the, the, that, that model was, um, wasn't as, as extreme as either one of those, but it was, it was, it was, I think that one was a nine to four to one ellipsoid. Okay. Um, and that was more just for visual purposes to show how the situation worked. Um, but the, the best fit to the data is sort of a saucer or pancake shaped object that is roughly six to six to one in its aspect ratio. And that's more likely than the classic image that you see when you read news articles about a new moon. Can I ask a question? Uh, well, Steve, you can ask. I put your mic on. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> So as you were speaking, I was looking at this data you were presenting, and it occurred to me that as the object was leaving the solar system, it's, it seems counterintuitive that it would be absorbing enough energy as it's leaving to actually cause an acceleration. Um, yeah, well, so, so that's, that's the point, right, is that if you do a careful calculation, um, it, it turns out that so, so its acceleration was dying off as one over the distance squared. So, so that is fine in terms of receiving energy from the sun. But what's not fine is that you know how much energy is from coming from the sun and you know how fast it's accelerating. And um, the properties of water simply don't allow for the observed motion. It just, it just doesn't work. Is there any chance it was a different gas that we're not detecting because we're looking for water? Yeah, so that's what... That's what or, uh, well, so, 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 so the, the one species that really works um, is hydrogen. So solid hydrogen um, can do a very good job of explaining all of the, all of the data. And so Would that explain the reddish hue then? Because hydrogen... So, so could the, be it could not be pure hydrogen. Pure hydrogen would be too effective at accelerating. Hydrogen is a great accelerant. Um, and so what had to be the case is that it, it, it had, if it formed that has a lot of hydrogen, a lot of the hydrogen is now gone as a consequence of traveling through the, 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 the galaxy. And you're left over with a sludge of sort of interstellar dust um, from the giant molecular cloud where we think it formed. And that interstellar dust, when kind of sludged together, absolutely has a reddish tint just for the same reason that um, objects in the Kuiper belt, you know, Sedna, things like that, have a reddish tint. So um, an object that started out with a lot more hydrogen and was pretty well spent by the time it got to the solar system um, 
completely explains the, the, the data. Now, whether that's what was actually happening is, is an entirely different issue, and we're going to have to wait to see more of them and sample them to know, but it's a, it's a theory that works pretty well. Are you going to spend the next lecture explaining the equation on top of that slide? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to come back. You saw that in September it's TBD, and the, 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 I'm going to be lecturing just about that for the entire lecture. Um, <laughs> See the number four. I get that. A couple of other questions. Um, you know, what, what would have happened if uh, if a muamua had hit the Earth at that speed and with that mass? Oh, 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 yeah. So, so that depends on whether the hydrogen theory is right. Um, so, solid molecular hydrogen has a very low density. It's 0 0.08 grams per cubic centimeter. So a 100 meter object coming in and it would have hit Earth at about 60 kilometers per second, um, made of a density of 0 0.08, well, it would make the news for sure. Um, it, would be, it would be the equivalent of, I think, several hundred megatons. So it would not be an Earth destroying um, impact by any means. It would not be on the order of the KT impact, but um, it would make the news. Hmm. Would that be like a COVID event? A COVID event? Um, it, it would be less serious than COVID, um, if, if I understood the question right. Um, what, what you can easily calculate is if, if, the, if, this, if a muamua was typical, if it kind of came through and was detected in, as a typical member of the population, then you should get one hit from the, an object like this about once every 30 million years. And in fact, something I'm interested in looking at is, is it, it would be a very hypervelocity impact. So a lot of these would be hitting, um, a muamua would have hit at 60 kilometers per second, but many of them would hit at 100 kilometers per second or even more. And what that does is it makes the flow during the cratering process compressible rather than incompressible. And so um, I have an idea that, that the crater morphology for something hitting that fast um, may have fundamental differences from craters that are, are created by sort of solar system velocities, which are usually 60 kilometers per second or substantially less. And so there should be a few craters on the moon um, that were created not by solar system impactors, but by interstellar impactors. And if we understand the physics of the cratering process with simulations to a high enough degree of fidelity, then we may have a chance of identifying those either on the moon or maybe Mercury would also be a good opportunity to look for those. If something like that hit the Earth, but it hit the ocean, what would happen? Would it just be a tidal wave? Um, so, so, so a moon mua, a moon mua that had hit the Earth would um, primarily have been an air blast. It would, have, it would have been larger than the largest um, um, nuclear devices that have been exploded, but not massively larger. Um, if, if a muamua had been, if, let's say, you know, we don't know for sure it was made of molecular hydrogen, but if it was made of, of iron with a little bit of molecular hydrogen ice thrown in for good measure, and that, that's not a theory, but if it were, then it would certainly make it and it would create a pretty large tsunami, especially if it hit in a shallow, a shallow region. Um, but, but again, it, it wouldn't, I mean, it just wasn't large enough to create these kind of extinction level events. I and mean, the KT impactor was, was bad, bad news. Um, you know, million, million times more energy to part, um, imparted than a more motive imparted. That thing was like the size of the Bay Area. Not a good, not a good deal. So could this be something like the Tunguska event? You know, I was thinking about that. Um, I, I think the answer is yes. Um, then there's no, there's no particular reason to think that Tunguska wasn't just a chondritic um, small asteroid that, that exploded in the atmosphere, similarly actually to um, the Chelyabinsk event, which was also primarily an air burst. Um, but you know, no, it could have, it, it could have been. But I think that the default Occam's razor points more towards Tunguska being a regular solar system impactor. So if we, we had uh, another question here from uh, would, it, would it be like foam or something or ice or? 
Um, it would be ice. It, so, so if it was pure H2, it would be a, a, a colorless ice. Um, in reality, because there would be a lot of interstellar dust mixed in and because a lot of the ice would already have sublimated, it, it would not have looked very different from a comet, but it would have been like a comet that seemed like it was made of styrofoam. Got another question um, from uh, Bosher. Can you explain the science behind Professor A.V. Loeb of Harvard's claim that Oumuamua is an alien spaceship? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, what, uh, what, what would make somebody think that this is, you know, other than it being from outside of the uh, solar system, what would make somebody think, yeah, this is, this is a likely, uh, or, you know, not even unlikely. Well, so, you know, what's interesting about that is, is that the, something that started to happen in, in astronomy is that when something interesting happens, aliens get promoted as an explanation. There was something called Tabby Star. Where, yeah, we had where this, we had her speak at uh, the observatory. Yeah, so, yeah, and, it was the and, same thing. And, and so, so um, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Um, the it's it's a new thing. Where was this paper published? Uh, which paper? By, by Avi Loeb. The, so the Bialy and Loeb paper came out um, in, that would, that would have been September of 2018, I believe. So the, the, um, the authors are B-I-A-L-Y, Bialy uh, and Loeb. Was it refereed? I mean, is it that, uh, I mean, Harvard is a respectful university, at least some people think, and Avi Loeb is an respectful is a respected astronomer. Um, how come it comes with such a crazy idea? Next question. <laughs> Very diplomatic. Um, Harvard and Yale have a long rivalry. So. Do we have an idea where this might have actually come from? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it came. <laughs> it came from. So, so, so I don't, I don't have the transparencies with me right now. But we, 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 there's this another mission called Gaia, um, which is getting astrometry to just a, like a billion stars to extraordinary accuracy. And so, what what we see with with Gaia are these various moving groups of stars, and um, the moving groups of stars were basically formed in a you know giant molecular cloud. X or N number of years ago, and the cloud disperses and the stars are just sort of like left. Um, if, if the cloud is very dense and you're left with an open cluster, like that you know, beautiful shot of um, the open cluster next to the galaxy, that's a giant molecular cloud that when it dispersed, the stars were feeling each other's gravity enough so that they're, they're, they're actually bound. A lot of times when the stars form, you don't get you know, bound association like the Pleiades or the Hyades or the open cluster that was in that photograph, but rather sort of a group of fellow traveling stars that sort of slowly disperse over time. And Gaia has been fantastic for identifying um, these what are called moving groups. And there's one moving group, um, the Columba um, Carina Association of Stars, which is kind of going right through the sun's neighborhood. And Oumuamua's uh, kinematics, its trajectory before it impacted the solar system, um, just puts it right in the middle of that moving group. And that the stars there formed 45 million years ago. Um, and so Oumuamua's trajectory points very, very strongly to its having formed 45 million years ago. Um, our idea is it formed not in association with one of those stars. That is, it's, we don't think it's a comet that was associated with a protoplanetary disk from one of those stars, but rather we think it's something that formed in the cloud itself. And when it didn't get ejected from the cloud, but rather as the cloud dispersed, it was sort of left traveling along with those stars. And it all makes sense because the molecular hydrogen should have a pretty short lifetime in the galaxy of a few tens of millions of years, and maybe a little bit longer if, if it's protected by sort of like the remnant sludge that's left over after the cosmic rays are evaporating the hydrogen. Um, and 
what's nice is this is, explains the shape very nicely. So if a Muamua started out as sort of, you know, a, a ordinary asteroid shaped object, um, as cosmic rays in the galaxy hit it, it gets eroded from all sides. It gets illuminated from all sides. And like a bar of soap that starts off relatively chunky, um, near the end when it's time to buy a new bar of soap, it's a thin sliver in the shower. And so we, we think that Oumuamua um, was effectively a thin sliver of its former self by the time it got to the solar system. And that's because we think that it was made of molecular hydrogen ice, and we think that that doesn't have a very long lifetime in the galaxy. And what's interesting as well is that it, it is extremely young in comparison to the 10 billion year lifetime of our galaxy. And if it was something like a comet that would last you know, for an indefinite period in the galaxy, you don't expect the first one that comes through to be only 45 million years old. You expect it to be 5 billion years old on average. So it's sort of like grabbing a random person. It turns out they were born two weeks ago. Um, it's not impossible, but it's, 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 it's sort of surprising. And that surprise goes away um, if it was a molecular hydrogen cloud product rather than um, a disk product like Bor Borisov very, very clearly is. Is general space cold enough to support molecular hydrogen as a solid? No, no. So, so, well, so my, so hydrogen, it depends on the pressure. But we lost your audio. Can you hear me now? Yes. I have this bad habit of like pulling my audio cord out while I'm talking. Um, but the, so, so the, the temperature of space is the microwave background temperature of 2.7. And there's illumination from stars, which um, that, 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 that radiation eats away at solid hydrogen over time. But more importantly, cosmic rays um, eat away at it over time. And so that's why it has a, a limited lifetime in the galaxy is because the solid hydrogen is, is not indefinitely, indefinitely stable. A comet like Borisov will last for the duration. Um, nothing is going to cause it to evaporate um, as it orbits through the galaxy, but, but hydrogen will slowly waste away. And we think that we're seeing the product of something that started out with a much larger fraction of molecular hydrogen and is now wasted away to something that was substantially, substantially smaller and which contains a residue of basically just the same kind of um, dust that goes into the formation of the planets. If, if Professor, that's uh, true, oh, go ahead, Kevin, sorry. if that's true, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't expect too many of them then, if that's the case, um, it would last very so, long. No, so, so, but, but we, so the fact that we're near this Karina Columba moving group um, means that we expect that, that there are quite a few of them, right? We, sh we just shouldn't have seen it if, if, if it was an extremely rare object. So I think that the fact that it was detected so easily suggests there's a lot more out there. Now, the statistics of one are never a solid argument to, to make. So it could be that, that something like this will never come through again. And but if that's there'd the be a, There'd be a preferred direction, presumably, then to these uh, new clusters. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so they, they should, con if, they're, if, if, if we're right with our theory, um, they should continue to come from the direction that Oumuamua came from. Basically, it's, it's, it was at rest with respect to the local standard of rest. And a better way to think of it is the sun plowed into Oumuamua, the solar system plowed into Oumuamua rather than we were sitting in space and it came to us. So it's the solar um, system version of a meteor shower. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And so the radiant, the radiant should be in Vega, in, in, in Lyra, near, near Vega. Um, Michael Southern would ask a question, and uh, I just wanted to kind of wrap, riff off it a little bit, too. He wanted to know uh, more about detection. Why are we missing it until it's so late? And if we could detect it earlier, if it came past now. But Gaia, as you'd mentioned, is going to be online, and pretty soon we'll be able to detect these far early. Or, or fair, Ruben. Um, is what will be online soon. But yeah, we should yeah, detect. Guy is, so, yeah, guy is running, but yeah, yeah so, so, so if, 
if it's a typical object, typical member of the population, which, which I think is the right assumption to make until we know otherwise, um, then LSST, I even have a figure here where we do show the calculation. I think it's this one. Um, this is sort of the rate that LSST can detect per month. So this is ba basically a couple per year. Fewer of them um, at magnitude 19, like Oumuamua, but more of them at magnitude 24, which uh, LSST is capable of doing. Um, and they should, yeah, so they, they should come primarily from, actually serpents is the, is the um, sort of the hot spot. And there should be a small number of them coming from Lepus, but, but this is the primary radiant for these guys. Why does that vary by month? Um, just because the, the solar system is heading into the cloud at 30 kilometers per second more during um, the, the fall and it's going away from, so it's, it's the same reason that you have your, your front windshield gets wetter than your back windshield during when you're driving in the rain. Another question, uh, would we expect that uh, the other objects that the LSST could detect would be similarly oddly shaped and degraded by cosmic rays, or do you think Ulmo was unusual? So, so the, that depends, so, so the answer is yes, we, we expect them to be also oddly shaped. And the reason is because they would all be roughly the same age, they would all have roughly the same histories, and they'd all be sort of like at the similarly bitter end of their, of their lifetime. Sort of like if, if, if you had a bunch of people who bought bars of soap and separately were using them in the showers and you'd come back after a month, they, you know, some guys don't shower very often. So those bars would be, right. So there'd be variation, but I would, I would expect none of Oumuamua's properties to be particularly unusual for the population. And so the answer is, yeah, I would expect them to have odd shapes. All right. Well, I don't have any more questions. I have one final question. Sure. I may have missed the definition at the beginning of the talk, but what differentiates a comet from this object? Is it just that the comets are made mostly of water or eject water? No, I think it's, well, that's, yeah, you could, you could say, you could say that because comets are made mostly of water. Um, but I think that the, the sort of like the technical definition is the presence of a coma. So the presence of micron-sized dust that's very, very, that's emanating from the object and which is very, very efficient at scattering, at scattering sunlight. So a comet is something that looks much brighter than it would be from just its simple size alone. And so Oumuamua was not a comet um, from, from that, that definition. Thank you. Okay, like good. Yeah, let's stick a fork uh, in. Uh, wrap it up. <laughs> hey. Oh, one thing, you know, since I've got you guys on the line, I would just like to um, just, just, just have a quick um, ad here. So I have this project called Metaculus. Um, and what Metaculus is, is it's, it's a website that, that basically is it's a crowdsourced prediction website. And um, I'm showing you here a bunch of questions that, you know, astronomer, you know, have astronomy themed interest. But Metaculus has a much wider um, sort of purview. If, if I show you the website itself, um, it has questions. Um, about geopolitics, about science. And um, we are getting people, trying to get people predicting. Um, and it's, it's done very well so far. And the, 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 the crowd of, of predictors, when averaged together and when track records are taken into account, can lead to predictions that are much more accurate than pundits will will come up with. And I know from long experience working with amateur astronomers or small telescope observers, 
is that you guys have a lot of expertise on a lot of different things. And so I'm just going to end my um, presentation with a, with a um, pitch for going to Metaculus and joining the community there. It's a lot of fun. It's interesting. And um, I think it can really help. Can you, uh, could you throw a link up someplace we can click on that? Sure. Um, are you seeing my screen? No, no, we just see the, the presentation still, so. Oh, oh yeah, let me, sorry. So that's, that's like I, trying I, to exploit the power of crap. I'm trying to do my pitch with, without my backup. So um, let's see. Um, let me, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing. Southern just, uh, so he, Michael just put the link in. Uh, in yeah, so now, I'm, now you should see um, Metaculus. And so what I had before, um, I went to this categories and down here in um, science and technology, where was that? That's a pretty broad um, list. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty broad list. Um, physical sciences, astrophysics, and cosmology. There's thousands of questions on here, and there's thousands of people have predicted. But these are just like the sort of the questions that that um, you know are, are are of interest, astronomical interest. So all sorts of things like will Betelgeuse be observed to go supernova before 2030? Some of these have a lot of predictions. Um, some of them have extremely long time frames. Some of them are very um, short, short time frames. Um, some of them are far out. Some of them are very prosaic. But I know that you guys, everyone on this call, I know has a lot of expertise, and I just know that you guys would be good at doing this. So I just want to uh, give a pitch for this. I like and it. So that there's. There's the, yeah, there's the physical science ones, but then, you know, if you just go to metapaculus.com and look at the questions that are getting traction, they're kind of more of a geopolitical bent. Um, but anyway, um, I'll stop sharing there. It's kind of rude to be promoting my stuff on the call, but I do think you guys would like it. This is all about you promoting your stuff. <laughs> this is, this is what it's <laughs> that's the thing, that's the gig. Yeah, well, I'm glad to have, yeah. So, another question. You're an astronomer at Yale. Does that imply or inf can I infer that Yale has a large telescope someplace that perhaps... Um, Yale, Yale has access to large telescopes. So um, I'm a theorist, as you've probably gathered, um, but, but Yale has a, a quite significant share of the Keck telescopes, um, as well as a share of Palomar and um, a number of smaller telescopes, especially in Chile. But the Keck telescope, uh, uh, Yale is a big partner in, and that's really the workhorse for, for our department. Uh, uh, you co-own the four meter on Keck, right? So, together with Wisconsin and... Uh... Yeah. There is a telescope at uh, Yale. Um, I don't know if it's still use your mind, but the, uh, I think it's in Bethel actually. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, so, so the, you know, I don't, I don't know what the dispensation of that is right now. So we have, we have the Leitner observatory, which is a kind of a public outreach facility on the Yale campus. And that has, um, that has several telescopes that are used for, for labs and for public viewing. Um, but, uh, you guys have better telescopes in your backyards. <laughs> We're looking for a way to be able to get additional photography time on the larger scope since one of our team members seems to be hogging it most of the time. Uh, now that we have a 14 inch. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to insert myself into, the, <laughs> into these. Uh, What's that? I'm sorry. Oh, I don't want to insert myself into these sensitive discussions. <laughs> Our crazy, our crazy local politics here. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's time to take that big picture view. Well, thank you so much for uh, you know for um, making some time with us today and explaining. Oh, wonderful! What it is. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for being an audience. I, I really, um, yeah. Well, I, I, I know from long experience that the small telescope observing community is extremely skilled and uh, always very, very large depth of interest and expertise. So it's always an honor to talk to you guys. Do you guys offer at Yale any kind of a 
a course in like an extension school course in astronomy or anything that you well, know, be a member of the actual Yale community to participate um, in? Well, if, if, if you want to participate in my classes, you're totally welcome. Just shoot me an email. Um, I, teach, I teach a class that's, that's interesting. It's, it's, it's called Earth in its Cosmic Context. And so it, it um, covers sort of everything that, that you know, a, a well-informed politician, you would hope they would know. And a lot of focus on order of magnitude estimation is sort of the way that Earth fits into the whole cosmos. I think it's an interesting class, even if you already um, know a lot of science or if you're an engineer, um, it, it still, I think, can be eye-opening and interesting. Um, and yeah, so if, if you're interested, um, just drop me an email. Could could it, uh, someone from the biological sciences understand it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's a, it's 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 general interest, absolutely. Alex, maybe you could post his email address later. Yeah, I'll I'll send it off for you, Steve. I've I've got it. Thank you. That does sound interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and. I'll, I'll see you guys around. We're in the same state. <laughs> Come visit us when, uh, you know, when we're past the cooties. Come oh, I will. I'll, 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 I'll do that for sure. It's a yeah, okay, needle, guys. crazy, crazy. <laughs> Legend has it we have a large telescope here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. I'll, I'll see you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next month. Thanks, everybody, for joining. <laughs>